Hello everyone. Welcome to my talk. Today I'm going to talk about why safe programming matters and why I would choose Rust for that. We will also talk about fast, safe and sustainable programming with Rust. I do have a sore throat, so sorry about that. So, my name is Deepu K. Shashidharan. I'm the co-lead of JHipster. I also created a nifty dashboard called k -dash for Kubernetes. I'm an open source aficionado and a polyglot developer. I work as a developer advocate at Okta with a focus on DevOps. I also publish frequently about languages and tech on my blog. You can find it on deepu.tech. Uh, please do follow me on Twitter if you are interested in my content. Uh, I have written a book about Jay Hipster. If you like this talk, you might uh, you know, like the book as well. So um, what is uh, safe programming or to be more precise, what does being safe mean for a programming language? Or rather, what does unsafe mean? So let's uh, set the context first so that we can appreciate what Rust offers. So um, safety can be categorized into three, memory safety, type safety, and threat safety, or four if you count null safety as a separate item, you know, for folks uh, like me who come from a Java JavaScript background. Uh, in a memory safe language, when you access a variable or an array, uh, sorry, or an item in an array, you can be sure that you are indeed accessing what you meant to or are allowed to access. In other words, you will not be reading or writing into the memory of another variable uh, or pointer by mistake, regardless of what you do, uh, you know, in your program. So why is this a big deal? I know, uh, doesn't all major programming uh, language ensure this? Uh, yes, uh, to a varying extent, you know, sort of. Uh, but languages are uh, unsafe by default. Uh, I mean, some languages are unsafe by default. Uh, for example, C, C++, you know. Uh, in C or C++, you can access the memory of another variable by mistake, or you can free a pointer twice. That's called a double free error. Sometimes a program continues to use a pointer after it has been freed, and that's called a free after use error or a dangling pointer uh, I think most uh, C, C++ programmers already know this and doesn't need an explanation. But for uh, others who are not uh, too familiar with uh, manual memory management, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, these things that has to be taken care of. So such behavior is categorized as undefined behavior as they are unpredictable because uh, they, they could happen at uh, runtime and they are unpredictable. They are prob no, not testable most of the time. So they, they are, uh, you know, you, you, you don't know what happens when, when these occurs. Uh, finally, um, there is also null safety. Uh, I come from a Java JavaScript background and uh, we are so used to the concept of null uh, infamous for being the worst invention in, in programming, even uh, you know, as per its uh, inventor. Uh, garbage collected languages need a concept of nothing so that a pointer can be freed when unused. But it also leads to issues and pain, like the you know, null pointer exception that we are so used to in, in Java, for example. Technically, this also falls under memory safety, but most memory safe languages still uh, you know, uh, let you use null as a value leading to null pointer errors and a uh, you know, lot of, lot of uh, issues. Uh, especially uh, null pointer errors is, null pointer error is like a huge headache in languages like Java and, and, and JavaScript. Uh, let's let's uh, look at uh, type safety. In a type safe language, uh, when you access a variable, you access it as the correct type of data it is stored as. This gives us the confidence to work on data without having to manually check for the data type during runtime whenever you use. You know, like if you have a data, imagine if you have to if you have to check and ensure uh, the correctness of the data every time you want to use that data. That that's that's going to be a, 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 a lot of annoyance, right? Um, so uh, memory safety is required for a language to be type safe. So a type safe language um, lets us work with the data without having to worry about its type. And we can be sure that when we use, uh, for example, an integer, that it is actually an integer. Or if you are using a floating point uh, number, it is actually a floating point number. So we can be sure of that in type safe languages. That is uh, type safety. And finally, there is uh, threat safety. In a threat safe language, you can access or modify the same memory from multiple threads at the same time without worrying about data races. 
This is generally achieved by using mutual exclusion locks or threat synchronization. But uh, threat synchronization is, you know, uh, uh, is not uh, not that intuitive, and it could still lead to uh, uh, issues. Or you know, uh, it's not the most easiest uh, uh, thing to do. Uh, there are also other issues uh, around uh, doing threat synchronization and stuff. But uh, mutual exclusion locks are uh, a quite standard way of doing this as well. Uh, threat safety is required for optimal memory and type safety. So generally, languages that are memory and type safe tend to be threat safe as well. So um, you may ask, like, why why does this why does all this safety matter, right? So let's let's explore a little bit more. So uh, memory safety uh, is is like one of the uh, biggest culprit when it comes to security uh, vulnerabilities and security issues. So memory safety related issues are the cause of majority of security vulnerabilities we encounter. Undefined behavior can be abused by a hacker uh, to take control of uh, you know of a program or to leak privileged information. I mean we, we saw what un undefined behavior is uh, right. Uh, so whenever there is a memory safety issues like a dangling pointer or a double free error or a oh, buffer overflow, all these kind of things are, are, are undefined uh, uh, behaviors and a, a, an experienced hacker can make use of this to uh, uh, create exploits. So uh, in memory safe languages, if you try to access an array element out of its bound, you will just crash the program with a panic or error, which is predictable behavior. Whereas in uh, memory unsafe language like C or C++, when you do the same, you might be gaining access to uh, 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 memory that you normally shouldn't have access to. So that way you can exploit and you know you can gather uh, uh, information or you can gather access, you can elevate privilege and all, all these kind of things. So this is why memory related bugs in C, C++ systems often result in CVEs and emergency patches. Uh, there are also other memory unsafe behaviors in C, C++ like accessing pointers from stack frames that have been popped, uh, memory that has been deallocated, I mean accessing a memory that has been deallocated, iterator invalidation and so on. Memory safe languages, even you know ones that are not as good as Rust, still safeguards against such security issues, and that's one of the biggest reason that uh, we we tend to um, you know use garbage collected languages for general purpose programming because of the memory safety that uh, those languages offer. Um, if you take a stats, you know we can see that as for Microsoft, seventy percentage of all CVEs they have are memory safety ones. Two thirds of all Linux kernel security vulnerabilities are also memory safety issues. 60 to 70 percentage of iOS and Apple uh, uh, security bugs are also memory safety issues as per an Apple uh, study. Uh, and that number is 90 percent for Android and 70 percentage, percentage for Chrome. So most of the popular security issues of all times are memory safety ones. And, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, looking at the ones that have names right like the most popular ones they're all most of them are memory memory uh, safety ones and of course uh, there is no suspense or there is no surprise that most of these uh, you know come from c c++ systems so imagine a world you know without memory safety issues imagine the amount of developer time saved the amount of money saved amount of resources saved sometimes i wonder you know uh, why do we still use uh, c c++ right or more like, why do we still trust humans against all available evidence to handle memory manually? And this is all without taking other non-CVE memory issues like memory leaks, memory efficiency, you know, all, 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 all sort of those kind of things into account. So all, all these stats are only for uh, issues, memory issues that lead to uh, security uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, wow, so that was all just from uh, memory safety issues. So if you take an average, it's like more than 70% uh, of all the security issues in our industry is because of memory safety issues, right? Uh, though not as notorious as memory safety, threat safety is also a cause of major headache for developers and can result in security issues. The best known type of uh, concurrency attack is called a talk to attack which is a race condition between checking a condition like a security credential and using the results. Talk to attacks are examples of integrity loss. Both information loss and integrity loss uh, uh, can be exploited and can lead to security issues. So these are the two types of uh, issues you normally will encounter uh, from threat safety issues like 
integrity laws and information laws, and both can be exploited. Uh, while threat safety related exploits are harder and less common than memory safety ones, there are still a possibility. I mean, uh, you, you wouldn't hear of these that often as memory uh, safety issues, but they are still exploitable and they are still a possibility. Uh, the, the only uh, uh, good thing going for us is that these are harder to detect because these are not very predictable, harder to detect, so also harder to exploit. But if someone manages to find a, a data race condition in an application, uh, it can be exploited. Uh, finally, there is uh, the type safety. Though uh, type safety issues are not as common uh, uh, as the other ones in terms of like, you know, at least in uh, type safe languages, like they are, they are harder to find. Um, but type safety issues can also lead to security issues. And type safety is extremely um, uh, you know, important for memory safety. So uh, if you uh, work with uh, uh, you know, languages that, that are weakly typed, uh, it is possible to create, uh, you know, it is possible to create memory safety uh, uh, issues out of type safety issues. So it is still, still an important one. So uh, now that we understand uh, how important programming safety is, right? Let me convince you why Rust is one of the safest languages and how it can avoid most of the security issues we normally encounter. Like imagine uh, you know, switching to a language that just you know, uh, just, just avoids like 70% of all the security issues that we face with uh, C, C++ systems. Uh, for those uh, not familiar, uh, Rust is a high level multi-paradigm language. It's ideal for functional and imperative programming. Uh, it has a very modern and, in my opinion, the best tooling for a programming language. Though it was uh, intended as a systems programming language, its advantages and flexibility has made it suitable for all sort of use cases and as a general purpose language. So uh, Rust throws around some buzzwords in its talks, uh, but they are not just marketing buzz. They actually mean it with full sincerity and they actually matter a lot. So let's explore some of them. The safety guarantee is one of the most important aspect of Rust. So Rust is memory safe, null safe, type safe, threat safe, uh, and, and uh, did I mention null safe? Yes, null safe by design. So you would have to go out of your way to break these guarantees using the unsafe keyword. So even in cases which, you know, if you're doing systems programming, there, there would be a lot of scenarios where you would have to, uh, you know, access memory manually or uh, manage memory manually or do some sort of unsafe programming. And even in those cases, when you would have to write unsafe code, you are making it explicit uh, so that issues can, uh, you know, using the unsafe keyword, you would have to make it explicit in Rust so that when, when you encounter an issue, it will be easy for you to track it down to that specific code block because you know where unsafe codes are. You don't have to worry about uh, any other parts of your program which is you know safe by default. So you'd have to only look at unsafe blocks or unsafe functions and see if there is an issue. So it will be much more easier to manage than in work than working in a fully unsafe language like C or C++. Uh, Rust ensures memory safety at compile time using its innovative ownership mechanism. I think ownership mechanism is one of the most innovative thing in Rust. Um, and, and also using the borrow checker built into the compiler. The compiler just does not allow memory unsafe code unless it is explicitly marked as unsafe in an unsafe block or an unsafe function. This uh, static compile time analysis eliminates, eliminates many types of uh, memory bugs and with some more runtime checks, Rust guarantees memory safety. So, uh, so there is no concept of null at the language level as I, as I mentioned earlier. Instead, Rust provides uh, the option enum, which can be used to mark the presence or absence of a value. So, making uh, so you know that that makes the resulting code null safe and much easier to deal with. And you will never encounter null pointer exceptions in, in Rust. The ownership and borrowing mechanism makes it one of the most memory efficient languages. I mean, mem most memory efficient language, while avoiding pitfalls that comes with manual memory management and garbage collection. So Rust has the memory efficiency and speed comparable to C, C++ and the memory safety better than that of garbage collected languages like Java, C Sharp or Go. So Rust is uh, statically typed and it guarantees type safety by strict compile time checks and by guaranteeing memory safety. This is not special as most modern languages are statically typed like, like Java, Go, etc. 
Uh, Rust also allows some level of dynamic typing with the dyn keyword and any type when required. But the powerful type inference and the compiler ensures type safety even in those cases. You know, even when you're trying to do dynamic typing, the compiler still uh, uh, tries its best to ensure type safety. Uh, Rust also guarantees threat safety using similar concepts it uses for memory safety. Uh, I, I mean the ownership and uh, ownership mechanism and borrow check. Right? Uh, so along with providing standard library features like uh, channels, mutex and ARC, the ownership mechanism makes it impossible to cause accidental data races from a shared state. Uh, this makes us confident to focus on the code and let the compiler worry about shared state between uh, threads. So you don't have to worry about threat synchronizations and any of any of those nonsense. Uh, but my most favorite feature of Rust is hands down the zero cost abstractions. So I can't stress enough how cool this is. Uh, especially if you're uh, if you're doing a lot of functional state programming. Um, if uh, you know, uh, I mean, if especially if you're doing a lot of functional state programming. Uh, if you're a developer using a high level language like Python, Java, or Go, uh, there is something that uh, you may not, you know, you know, you may not be consciously thinking about. While writing those cool layers of abstraction that impresses your colleagues, every layer, every one of those layer of abstraction adds additional instruction sets and affects, your, affects the performance of the overall program. In most cases, it might not be noticeable because you know the, whatever you're adding is like in microseconds or worst case milliseconds. So it may not be noticeable, uh, but it is still there. Uh, and, and we all know that imperative code is more performant than functional code, right? Functional style code. And that's due to abstractions as well. And that's why uh, you can always hand code more perform performant code uh, in, in those languages. So whenever, you know, like if you're working with uh, uh, languages like Java, Go, or C Sharp, or Python, Ruby, or whatever, and when you encounter uh, performance issues, that is why most of the times you can hand code, you can optimize, you can tune, you can you know convert stuff to more imperative code. You can you know uh, you know uh, write you know you can rewrite iterators to for loops to increase performance and stuff uh, stuff like that. So you, there are these kind of hand coding uh, uh, techniques that you can use in those languages to extract more performance in very performance sensitive application. Um, now, some languages have compilers that are smart enough to convert some of those abstractions to more performant bytecode, but only languages like Rust and C++ offers true zero-cost abstractions, meaning you can write the code in whatever style and with whatever abstraction without having to worry about performance cost, as the compiler will always generate the most performant bytecode possible, meaning you, you, you cannot hand code it any better than what the compiler has done. So for example, you can choose to create or use any number of abstractions uh, to structure your program. Uh, you could use loops, iterators, uh, you could do functional imperative programming and the result remains the same. The compiler will produce the best possible implementation of the machine code for the use case regardless of the flavor of your, uh, uh, you know, regardless of the flavor of the code you, you choose to write. So in Rust, some of the most notable uh, zero cost abstractions are ownership and borrowing, iterators and closure APIs, uh, async, await, and futures, unsafe blocks, and the module boundary. These are the uh, very notable uh, zero cost abstractions in Rust. So um, here is a, uh, here's a small example uh, you know, to show you, you know, what I meant with uh, zero cost abstractions. So the example is using Java and Rust. So on the uh, left side, you see the Java code. Uh, in, the Java, in the Java version, performance drops as the abstractions increase, while in Rust, there is no noticeable difference. Though, so uh, in, 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 the, in the code that you see, um, the, first, the first example on both is uh, a factorial using uh, a for loop. The second one is factorial using recursion. So the for loop doesn't have any abstractions, it's just simple for loop. So that's the most performant version possible, especially in, in Java. If you look at the numbers, uh, it's uh, the average is around uh, 10 nanoseconds per operations. Um, whereas when you do the same with recursion, it increases the, the, the performance drops and it is now 20 nanoseconds per operation. So the, the, the you know, it, it just doubled, the, the time just doubled. And if you try to use uh, some inbuilt abstractions like uh, uh, 
um, uh, streams uh, and use the reduce method, then it, it, it further drops and becomes 23 nanoseconds per operation. Whereas in Rust, uh, the normal you know, iterative uh, uh, loop using a while loop, um, it has uh, an average of around uh, you know, 8.5 nanoseconds per operations. And if you do the same in recursion, it still has around the same 8.6 nanoseconds per operation. And if you use inbuilt uh, abstraction like an iterator, actually you get the best performance. You get around 6. Uh, 6 uh, around 6.5 uh, nanoseconds uh, per operations. So that's, that's, that's incredible, right? So you can write your code in whatever way you choose and you don't have to worry about performance. And, and most of the times, inbuilt abstractions might even pr provide better uh, performance than your hand-written, hand-optimized uh, code because the, the inbuilt abstractions uh, would have uh, some internal optimizations and boundary checks and all these kind of things that will you know, give a little bit more uh, performance. You could also hand-code those, but it's not required. Rust will do those things for you, so you don't have to worry about those stuff. So to me, uh, zero-cost abstractions are like the most underrated feature of Rust and the, for personally, the, 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 like one of the best feature of Rust. So um, Rust is also immutable by default and mutations have to be declared explicitly. This along with the ability to pass by value or reference makes it super easy to write functional code without side effects. So if you are a fan of uh, functional programming, then you know, Rust is for you. Uh, Rust also has excellent support for advanced pattern matching. So pattern matching is used extensively in Rust for error handling and control flows. Uh, it's also used extensively in standard libraries and, and stuff. And, and you would see that everywhere in Rust style guides, Rust examples, documentation, and so on. Uh, Rust also has advanced generics and traits with type aliasing and type inference support. It has great type inference. Um, um, Rust generics are extremely powerful. Uh, so powerful that sometimes, uh, not sometimes, most of the times you could easily end up with uh, very complex generics, when, uh, especially when you combine uh, generics with lifetimes and you know dynamic uh, stuff, uh, it could easily become uh, complex. Similarly, Rust also have, uh, also have very powerful traits uh, with uh, a lot of uh, cool features like uh, def default implementations, placeholders, operator overloading, trade bounds, uh, compound traits, and, and so on. Uh, so uh, uh, finally, there is also support for metaprogramming using macros. So Rust macros are like super cool. Rust supports both declarative macros and procedural macros. And, and macros can be used uh, like annotations uh, for adding you know, stuff like uh, serialization, deserialization using the derived uh, annotation. You could add uh, 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 you know, uh, behavior. Uh, to struts and uh, to, to attributes and stuff. You could use um, um, macros as ast attributes. You could use them, use them like functions, like the inbuilt println, uh, println and format functions, for example. They're all macros. So a lot of uh, 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 Rust standard uh, 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 library stuff is macros as well. So it, it's quite cool. It, it, it's basically, it, it basically lets you, uh, you know, uh, do meta programming. It uh, lets you write more concise code and, and write more reusable code without having to worry about uh, generics and stuff like that. Uh, it's, uh, it's not just the language features. Rust has one of the best compilers and the best tooling that I have, uh, that I have seen and I have experienced. And, and I have worked with uh, the, the JavaScript ecosystem, TypeScript and stuff. Uh, JVM languages like Java, Kotlin, Scala, Groovy. I have worked with Go, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, PHP, C, C++, and maybe a couple of other like non-mainstream languages. And I have not seen a compiler as good as uh, uh, Rust, and I have not seen a tooling as good as Rust. And 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 the closest in tooling maybe would be JavaScript or Go. But yeah, it's hands down has great tooling. Cargo is like it's 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 super super cool and and the way uh, you know the rust tooling uh, from the get go i mean you 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 download uh, rust up and you manage everything from there it installs uh, you know rust c it installs rust docs it installs cargo clippy everything it it installs whatever you require you can manage versions using the same command you can update uh, to different you know stable nightly or whatever you can manage versions you can downgrade upgrade everything so it's it's really cool even it even has 
uh, inbuilt documentation. So you can use Rust doc offline to get uh, documentation for the version that you have installed. So how awesome is that, right? So it also has great documentation. Um, one of the great, uh, one of the best documentations uh, among programming languages uh, as per uh, uh, community uh, agreement, I, I would say. So yeah, it also has great, uh, it, it has great language features, great tooling, great compiler, great documentation. And finally, it also has a great community. So it has a lot of, uh, you know, really good things. And, and that's the reason Rust has been the most loved language uh, for uh, six years in a row, five, I think five or six years in a row uh, in, in, in the Stack Overflow uh, survey. So it has a great community, which is diverse, welcoming, friendly, and vibrant. The ecosystem is quite young, but is rapidly maturing. Unlike many general purpose languages, which are not appropriate for some use cases due to the trade-offs they make, Rust is uniquely positioned to work across the spectrum without any major disadvantage. So it can be the general purpose language for any use case from client side, web assembly, um, uh, to uh, web apps, microservices, system programming, and even for Kubernetes. I mean, you know, you can use web assembly uh, code return with Rust as Kubernetes uh, uh, workload. So <clears throat> in my opinion, the only thing holding back Rust is the maturity of the library ecosystem, which is only a matter of time to get better, uh, I think. Uh, so C, C++ and Go might be the ones to be displaced most in the short term by Rust, in my opinion. Uh, I think Java, uh, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, you know, etc. are safe for a long while due to their massive presence in large scale applications the maturity of their ecosystem and especially due to the migration cost you know like and and of course like you you don't always you know you, you don't need rust for everything i mean uh, so you, if you have a web application written in java it's perfectly fine you don't you don't have to use rust for that because it may not be a, a performance uh, a critical thing right so in that case you don't have to use rust for that um, so uh, 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 the i i would say yeah, uh, before that, like, like let's also see, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the other side. So all this doesn't mean that, uh, you know, Rust uh, is a silver bullet. So there are also uh, some downsides. Um, there are issues like steep learning curve and the complexity, uh, but it's the closest thing to a silver bullet in my opinion. That doesn't mean I'll, you know, I'll, uh, um, I or you should start using Rust for everything. Uh, for example, I still enjoy being a polyglot developer and I'm still invested in Java, JavaScript and Go ecosystem. Uh, uh, but if the use case requires speed and or concurrency or building system tools or CLIs, which are like, you know, performance critical, then I'll be giving Rust the first preference. There's, there's no doubt in that. So uh, if, if the use case uh, requires best possible performance, then yes, Rust. And I don't think I'll ever uh, uh, advise or recommend using C, C++ when I know that there is Rust for a new project, you know, like, so of course, migration may not be uh, possible, but even that is being considered. I mean, uh, given that, uh, you know, uh, Rust is uh, uh, accepted as second language for Linux kernel, so everything is possible. Uh, but I would, I would personally love to see everything in C, C++, you know, migrated to Rust because I don't see any reason to use C++ when there is something like Rust that offers uh, uh, same uh, uh, speed and efficiency without the the downsides. Uh, so um, yeah, um, uh, Go and Java, JavaScript, they still have their own uh, use cases and value. You know, you don't need uh, extreme performance for everything. Sometimes you need uh, uh, readability and easy to write and read code. So you will go for Go. Sometimes you need uh, stability of ecosystem, uh, maturity of libraries. Then you go for Java or C sharp based on whatever uh, ecosystem you are in. And for client side stuff, of course, you go with JavaScript. <clears throat> so in my opinion, Rust can be the ideal general purpose language once the ecosystem matures. Uh, the, the target for a high level language and low level languages are quite, quite different. And hence, the features and goals differ as well. Rust is a high level language and hence is human oriented, but it also has performance and efficiency that puts it into close league with low level languages and more specifically mid level languages like C and C++. So Rust also scored great in a 2017 research uh, comparing speed, memory efficiency and energy efficiency of programming languages. And I'm pretty sure that those numbers uh, you know, would have only become better after in, you know, in the last uh, five years. 
Um, do note that there has been some criticism from different language communities for this research, especially regarding how optimized the code was when uh, used for benchmarks. Uh, that might also explain Rust scoring a bit less in memory efficiency than Go, uh, since real world examples show a different trend because Rust is known to be extremely memory efficient as well as fast and energy efficient because speed and energy efficiency go hand in hand. So, so normally a language would offer a choice between safety and speed and high level abstractions. At the very best, you can pick two of those. For example, with Java, C Sharp, Go, Python, etc., you get safety and high level abstractions at the cost of a runtime overhead in terms of garbage collection or reference coding or whatever. Whereas in C, C++, um, it gives you speed and abstractions at the cost of memory safety. But Rust offers all three and a good developer experience and a great community as a bonus. So I don't think there are any other mainstream languages you know, that, that can claim that. Uh, so to, to, to finish off, um, you, know, you won't appreciate Rust unless you spend a few weeks uh, building something in it. Uh, that's, that's how I started appreciating Rust. Uh, the initial steep learning curve could be frustrating or challenging depending on how you see it and what perspective uh, you, you take. But once past that initial steep learning curve, it's hard not to uh, love the language because after all, it's a toddler with superpowers. So that's it folks. I hope the talk was worth your time and uh, I hope I convinced you to look into Rust and consider Rust uh, you know, when you have uh, your next uh, uh, project that, that might, for, the, for which you might normally consider C, C++ or Go or something like that. Uh, so thank you for attending. Uh, you can reach out to me via Twitter and do check out my website uh, for more content if you like this talk. So thank you, Fox. Uh, have, a, have a great uh, rest of the conference. Bye.